Okay, before I share a very quick uh, devotion, I just want to mention this that I just remembered. I don't know if you guys remember my first message this year. How many of you remember the tagline of my first message this year? Not WhatsApp message, huh? CYF message. Yes, how fit are you? What was the tagline? It was related to COVID. No? Don't remember? Is it finding God in the pandemic? I'm not sure. Something related, but I want to bring this up before I even start. Because all of you who shared testimonies actually made my point real, right? So I want to share this. I, I shared this at the end of my first message this year in January. You can, have, you, you can choose to have either one of these perspectives. You can either say either one of these things, right? You can either say, I couldn't do something because COVID happened, right? Or because COVID happened, I could do something. Remember that? Sounds familiar? I think all of your testimonies uh, this morning, right? Or this afternoon, reflected the point that if it were not for the pandemic, if it were not for coronavirus, some of these things might not have happened. I want you guys to just think about that for a while. Not just today, but like in the upcoming days leading up to new, the new year. We don't know what the new year holds, right? But guys, God is working and God is in control regardless of the difficulty of the situation that you've been through, difficulty of your family situation or whatever, God has been there. And I'm going to link that to the devotion I'm going to share, which is don't lose Christ at Christmas. Don't lose Christ at Christmas. Now, uh, Christmas is filled with so much festivities, activities, right? That often it is really easy to just focus on all the festivities. Someone just spotlighted me. All the festivities and activities that we really forget the true meaning of Christmas. So this is actually going to sound quite cliche. This whole message is going to sound a bit cliche. But really what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is share with all of you the gospel. Then you, you're probably like, what? I'm only a Christian, why are you sharing me the gospel? Guys, Paul in Romans 1 shared with the Romans who were Christians the gospel. So I'm going to remind you guys about the gospel so that you can remind other friends about the gospel and ho hopefully even you know during this Christmas season, New Year, Chinese New Year that's coming up in just what? Two months. You can share this good news and this gospel with others. Okay, so I don't think I need to tell you guys the true meaning of Christmas, right? You know, there's a cliche that goes, you can't have Christmas without Christ, right? Without Christ in Christmas, you will just have mess or mess. Someone else said, right? I, I don't mean to be punny, but that's what, that's, that's what someone else said. Or, you know, like Jesus is the reason for the season. All really nice sounding. But if I ask you guys, is that true for you? Is Christmas Christmas without Christ? So we're going to really just spend our time in one passage of scripture. Uh, it's quite long. Um, so I'm just going to get... Uh, Christina, can you read... Uh, yeah, I got Christina last week also. Can you read Luke 2 verse 1 to 7? Okay, but before you read Luke 2 verse 1 to 7, let me, let me just give you a bit of history so that you know where this passage is in the Bible, right? Um, so, you all know Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem, right? But by the time Jesus arrived in Bethlehem, now I'm just going to paint you a picture of what was going on then. God's people or the Israelites were on the brink of despair. Despair is like no hope, sad, and so on and so forth, okay? What happened was they had endured years of exile. You all know what exile is, right? Exile means kind of sepak keluar or get kicked out of your own country, right? They were kicked out of their own country. Finally, they returned back. 
Okay. But when they returned back, they found out that Rome, Rome was a superpower politically of that day. Okay. You all know the Roman Empire. Emperor Nero. Okay. Uh, superpower of that day. They found out that Rome had come and ruled their land. So imagine they came back from exile, thought they had hope. Then Manatao, you know, Rome was ruling their land. So in, in a sense, the Israelites came home, but they were not free. Okay? So at that point of time, right, bear in mind that Israelites knew the whole Old Testament. They knew the Torah. They knew what the prophets said and all, right? They knew what Moses said, what David said, what uh, Solomon said, what Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all these fellows said. Okay? So it, at that point, it must have seemed that God had totally abandoned them or didn't care for them enough to just leave them in oppression. And they heard all of God's promises, everything that, that you know, God said in the Old Testament that, you know, I will be with you. Abraham's descendants are going to be multiplied like the stars in the sky. They heard all these things from God. But God didn't appear to be with them. Okay, and that's where Luke 2 comes in, all right? I sound like Bible project. But anyway, that's, that's, what, that's where Luke 2 comes in. So, Christina, verse 1 to 7. Just follow the story uh, slowly. Okay. So, in those days, a decree went out from a Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, this time they came for her to give. The time has came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddle cloth and laid him in a manger, because there were no place for them in the inn. All right. Everyone following so far, right? I, I, there's actually a lot of detail here, but I don't really have the time. This is not a Bible study. There is, if, but if you're keen, go and read up on this thing called a census. All right? I'm just going to put it here so that if, if you're keen, you can just go read up. So a census is basically like a, a constituency check. They, 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 yeah. count the, they count the number of people like in a certain group or town. That's why uh, that decree went out from Caesar Augustus. You can go check it out. It's all very political and, and social. Then the other thing that, that you might want to read up is this word betrothed. The word betrothed actually means engaged. Okay? Engaged. So you might, and, and, and the engagement then and the engagement now, very different one. Okay? So you might want to go read out on that when you're more keen. But basically, uh, that's the story. Okay, now let's continue with verse 8. Can I get Trisha? Verse 8. To 14. In the same region, there were was, there was shepherds out in the field, watching over, keep, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of, and the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone, shone around them. And they were, they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of, good, of great joy that you will be for all the people. For unto you is born in the day in the of David, Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among these with whom he is pleased. All right. Thank you, Christina and Trisha. Last passage. Let me get Elias. Verse 15 to 20. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who had heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. All right. Thanks, Elias. Okay. So we just read 20 verses from the account that we, you know, quote every, almost every uh, Christmas of the birth of Jesus. Now, in the chat, or you can unmute and say, I want you guys to summarize in a word or a phrase what we just read. What do you get out of what we just read? Besides the fact that Jesus was born, okay? Don't say Jesus was born. We know Jesus was born. But 
what do you get from the 20 verses we just read? To me, the summary of this 20 verses is this. Christmas was a significant event. Someone said about the first Christmas just now. If you were to, rec- if you were to see, right, the first Christmas actually wasn't celebratory one. It was actually very dull. That's another thing you want to go and read. Go and read about the first Christmas. It was completely opposite from celebratory. It was very, very dull. In fact, I was talking about it at lunch yesterday. You know, when Jesus was born, this is just an interesting fact. Huh? It looked like Mary committed a serious sin because she was pregnant before she was married. I don't know whether you all saw that. That's how serious Christmas was like in the first year. And then y'all, I told you just now about the political situation as well, right? So y'all can go read up more. Those of y'all who like history and things like that can go read up more. But the fact is this, Christmas was a significant event. I'm going to show you why it was a significant event with these five points. Look at the first line in red, okay? It says in verse 9, they who were the shepherds were filled with great fear. Now, would you randomly be filled with great fear if if it was like a useless, you know, like a nothing event? No, right? It would be something quite extraordinary for you to be filled. I mean, some people scared of like ticha and like cockroach and all that, but this is not that kind of fear, right? But for the shepherds to be filled with great fear, it had to be something quite significant. Okay, so this is my first reason why I think this was uh, Christmas was a significant event. The shepherds were filled with great fear. Number two is the, one, the first sentence in green. I'm not going to read it. But basically what happened was the angels appeared to make a proclamation. Now I asked this in, in Twins last week. I'm going to ask this to you guys. How many of you in your 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 30 years of living, have seen an angel appear in front of you? Put up your hand. Reaction button. How many of you have seen an angel appear? If you all have literally seen an angel appear, I want to meet you and hear your story right now. No one? No one. Because angels appearing is very rare. I don't think Pastor Stephen has seen an angel appear. So anyway, but like angels appearing are very rare. So the fact that the angels appeared to make a proclamation showed that this had to be a significant event because a rare occurrence happened. You all see that? Okay, next point. The one in red. Not just the angels appeared to make a proclamation, a multitude, a multitude in, in biblical terms is at least a thousand. Okay, at least a thousand at least a thousand heavenly hosts appeared. Imagine that. So not just angels, uh, heavenly hosts, heavenly creatures, beings appearing. Imagine that. Even more rare, showing that Christmas or the birth of Jesus was a significant event. Next, number four. The fourth reason why I think Christmas was, was a significant event. Look at the words in green. The shepherds made known what had been told to them. Earlier during prayer, Tiff, Tiffany was sharing um, about how good news is meant to be shared, right? Like we, we heard Spider-Man No Way Home was an awesome movie, 9.5 on IMDb. We're going to talk about it, right? We're going to spoil it for some people. I'm not going to spoil it now, but you're going to spoil it. You're going to talk about it for a long time, right? The whole Marvel Cinematic Universe, how awesome it is. You're going to share it for a long time. Now, the shepherds made known what they had seen and heard. Now, you wouldn't make known what's not important. Right? Like, if I tell Elias today, I had chicken chop for dinner last night. He's not going to tell his mom. He's not going to tell like, his friends that Michael Loon ate chicken chop last night. Because it's not an important thing. Like, who cares if Michael ate chicken chop last night? But if I tell Elias that, hey, Elias, I have a way for you to make one million ringgit in one day. You think Elias is not going to tell his friends? I think he's going to tell his friends immediately after this Zoom call. Right? Y'all know what I'm saying, right? So obviously, the shepherds made known 
something that was really, really important. Hence, Christmas was a significant event. Okay? And the fifth point is this. There was a worship choir among the shepherds. Verse 20. They glorified and praised God. It had to be something significant. So I've given you guys five. There could be more reasons, right? But these five reasons from scripture is why I think that Christmas is an important event. Everyone with me, right? So now I'm going to make this more um, applicable to us. This was then, uh, huh? to the shepherds those days. This was 2,000 years ago. Things are very much different from today. I'm going to give you guys two reasons why Christmas is significant to the 44 of us here on this call and is significant for everyone in this world, whether they know it or not. So this is where I'm telling you, I'm going to share with you the gospel. The gospel, which is good news, all right? The first point is this. Why Christmas is significant to us is God stepped into human history. God stepped into human history. You know, leaving his home in heaven, Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph as a baby, right? So Jesus was fully God, fully man. Okay, fully God, fully man. And Jesus was born into time and space as you and I now know, right? There was time and there was space. He wasn't born into a vacuum. Huh? He was born into the world, okay, as we know it helpless and dependent on the very humans he created. Now try and think about that for a bit. This sounds very, very weird. God, three in one, right? God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit created humans. Jesus came to humans as a baby dependent on the humans he created. Now does that sound out of whack or what? But that's God stepping into human history. Now, I'm going to give a lousy example, but I hope you get the point. Imagine you're staying in the United States. Okay? Imagine you're staying in the United States. And all of you know President Joe Biden, right? Who was just re -elect uh, elected in the past one year. Imagine you're staying in the US. And President Joe Biden, oh man, this being... This is being recorded. I need to be careful. President Joe Biden leaves the White House to spend daily time with you in your Chaplang house, not White House, in your own town. He comes and spends daily time with you. Now, you probably cannot even believe or imagine that, right? Well, well I don't think any American will believe that. Okay? But that's what God did. That is what God did. He left his white house. Think picture with me. Huh? Heaven came down to earth through Jesus so that he can live in us through the Holy Spirit. Now, God is not just a president of one country. Huh? God's the president of all the countries in this world. He's not just the president of all the countries. He's the creator of heavens and the earth. Now, Joe Biden can't even spend time with Americans. God can spend time with every human being on the face of this planet because of Jesus. And that's why in Matthew 1 verse 23, which is on screen, Jesus is called Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? Emmanuel means God with us. So if you do not know what God is like, you do not know who God is, look at Jesus. If you know who Jesus is and you see what Jesus has done, you know what God is and what God has done. You're following me? This is the gospel, friends. This is the gospel and that's why we, we as Christians talk about Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. We share Jesus. We talk about what Jesus' love is. So we know that Jesus obeyed the Father every step of the way, right? Not concerned by the expectations of others, but he stepped into our story to write a better story. And here's a, the other big shocking news. Remember I told you just now there was a big political situation when Jesus was born? 
with the Roman Empire, Jesus didn't come just to bring relief to the political situation. Jesus came ultimately to save his people from sin. And this is the relation to Easter, which we're going to celebrate in four months. Christmas and Easter cannot be separated. It is actually one big event. So what I'm trying to say to you, I'm trying to say to you that God stepped into human history. He cares for the details of our life. He doesn't just care about what's happening in the world. He cares for you, Anika. He cares for you, Trisha. He cares for you, Cheryl. He cares for you, Daniel. He cares for you, Zichen. He cares for every single detail of our life. That's number one. Number two, God's pursuit of people is different from what we would expect. You know, in, in, in human terms, we will only reach out if people respond well, right? We will spend more time with people that have the same interests as us. That's our pursuit of people, right? God's pursuit was really, really, really different. You know, it, think about living in those times, right? The Israelites probably expected a savior to set them free from their political oppression. What did God do? God sent a baby. And the Israel, just imagine you're living then, right? You're like going through major political situations. Imagine, you know, like when Malaysia is going through major political situations. In fact, right now also, we are going through different challenges, right? Imagine like God says, Malaysians, I give you a baby. You're like, what? I'm expecting like a Superman, man, like a hero to solve these problems. And God gives a baby? So friends, God chooses to work in ways we really do not expect. Let me show you something else. Do you all realize who Jesus revealed to himself, uh, who God revealed himself through Jesus first? Yes, Elias. Very good. You were paying attention last week. God revealed himself to shepherds. Shepherds. If you all don't know what shepherds are, right? Shepherds are, in, in today's culture, people who live in the kampong. That's who shepherds are. Whereas the rulers, the authorities and all were, were in their nice, beautiful places. You know, people working in consulting firms, people who are bosses of companies. God didn't reveal himself to them first. He revealed himself to shepherds. And just a few verses later, you will see that the shepherds were making known what God had revealed. So question, why do you think God revealed himself to shepherds? Why do you think God didn't reveal himself to like the super prestigious people of the day? Jesus revealed himself to lowly shepherds because he probably knew that they had the humility, they had that acceptance, and they would just believe without asking. I'm going to bring out a very, very real example. People like Vic would understand what I'm talking about because we've been on mission trips. You go to a mission trip, right? Some, 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 like some simple village in like the Philippines or in Indonesia. And you share with the crowd, friends, Jesus loves you. They will start breaking down and crying. And they will start coming up to the speaker and saying, Mike, Thank you so much for sharing that with me. I really needed to hear it. But if I go to the middle of KLCC and say, guys, Jesus loves you. They'll be like, what the heck? Stone him. Stupid guy. Why is he saying this? You shouldn't be saying this kind of stuff in KLCC, man. Da, 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 da. Now, what's the difference? The difference is environment. The difference is culture. The difference is people. Prestigious people or wealthy people kind of have a block because of their pride, because of their background. Yo, so I'm just trying to explain what I'm trying to say, right? That's why I believe God revealed himself to shepherds. And you know, looking at us today, you might not be the most popular person, 
you might not be the most wealthy person. You might be the one just scraping through studies with like two A's, three A's. Friends, God pursues you. Not because how good you are, how great a performer you are. Yeah, yeah, count no A. I actually had two A's in SPM, by the way. Um, God pursues people not because they had five A's in SPM, 10 A's in SPM, degree in engineering, first class honors. God doesn't pursue you because of that. God pursues you because of his grace, which is a never-ending pool of love and mercy, constantly offering us freedom from sin and making us like his son, Jesus. I know I've been speaking really fast, but friends, that's the gospel in 10 minutes. I don't expect you to copy-paste what I just said. Say in your own words. But the essence of the gospel is this. God stepped into human history through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. And the way God pursues us is different from how people pursue us. So in conclusion, I'm just going to end this way. I actually have some discussion questions, but we are out of time. I will send it through the leaders and then the leaders can just, maybe you can just use the next couple of days leading up to Christmas to just think through this. But let me just conclude this way and then I'm going to just give you a quick opportunity to respond and pray. It will be the saddest thing on the face of this earth that God, who is all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, he did everything to be with us and we do nothing or close to nothing, to be with Him. That's an actual fact, guys. That's a very, very sad fact. That God did everything to be with us, and we do almost nothing to spend time with Him. Everyone with your eyes closed. This is very, very personal time. I'm not going to take long anymore. We're going to be done in five minutes. Everyone with your eyes closed. I just want to speak to two groups of people. First group of people is this. You have been trying to win God's approval. Or maybe you, you think right now that, hey, you know, I'm actually not good enough to be saved. I've not performed. I've been a bad child. I've been a bad student. I don't come to youth as often as, as I will. I actually, my, I actually haven't been going to church. I don't deserve God's love. I'm here to say, like what I said just now, that you don't really need to do anything to earn God's love. God has done everything. All you need to do is accept it. So this is the first group of people. And the second group of people is, maybe today you're going to, you, you want to just say, honestly, Mike, I actually don't know Jesus. I've been doing this church thing I've been following my parents to church. My parents do devotions, Bible study at home. I kind of just listen to them, you know. But I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I don't feel that God is with me. This whole Emmanuel thing, this whole gospel that you just shared, I'm not feeling it very real. And friends, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. To say that this Christmas, as I celebrate with my family and my friends, I want to have that full assurance that God is with me through Jesus and believe that Jesus is setting me free from the oppression of sin. Father, thank you for your gift. Thank you for the greatest gift of your son, Jesus. And today I bring my friends here who have physically responded and maybe some of us who are wrestling right now. We need to respond. But you hear the cries of our heart. You know each of us by name. You are interested in every detail. I just pray that you will encounter us. Afresh and anew. This Christmas. I pray that the gospel that has been shared, the message that has been shared, will take root in our hearts and be so real. Causing us to share the good news. Causing us to be ambassadors and witnesses of this gospel that you have shown us. Thank you, Lord, for your love. And may we continue to experience it day in, day out. Not during Christmas, not only during Christmas, Lord, but every day of our lives. 
And those of us who are just rededicating ourselves to want to believe you, Lord, want to accept you as Lord and Savior. I pray that you will just encounter us with your love. I pray that you will just accept us by your grace and your mercy as we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that you are Lord. We know, Lord, that you are accepting us. We know, Lord Jesus, that you are with us. So I commit all the young people here um, today with, with all the challenges that we face, with everything that we will have to face, even next year, we believe, Lord, that you are with us and we have victory in Jesus. So I commit this time to you, commit all of us to you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.